she is Yushin, uh, Sensei Yushin Ikeda. As you can see from her bio, uh, she's a socially engaged Buddhist teacher at East Bay Meditation Center in downtown Oakland. Uh, she has authored a number of publications and she's been involved in a great many uh, very important activities uh, that you can see here. Some of you remember that a few years ago she was the keynote speaker and workshop leader in our Federation of Dharma School Teachers League conference. Uh, leading us in diversity work, which is uh, still resonating within the BCA. It's really wonderful. And recently she returned from a trip to the Vatican where she met Pope Francis and um, maybe would relate some of her experiences there as well. Uh, today, uh, Sensei um, uh, Ikeda will speak on creating inclusive and welcoming Buddhist Sanghas in the U.S. And thank you for such a wonderful and illuminating uh, PowerPoint and presentation, uh, Elaine. I learned a lot about BCA. And in preparing for this presentation, I had the chance to reflect on my very uh, long and for me rich and delightful association with um, uh, various reverends and members of the BCA in various locations over the years. And I want to thank all of you uh, personally and the BCA for the enrichment to my own spiritual practice and my own spiritual path. So today, I do want to talk about creating inclusive and welcoming Buddhist Sanghas in the United States from the point of view of my um, involvement with a new kind of temple that we're building in downtown, creating in downtown Oakland, called East Bay Meditation Center. We're on 17th Street at Harrison, so kind of towards Lake Merritt, very accessible by the 19th Street BART and bus. And um, so, one of the things that we're doing is we are putting a lot of energy, and we do have limited capacity. Uh, we're only eight years old, but from the very beginning, our foundation has been in uh, trying to really investigate from with this Dharma Foundation that um, Reverend Elaine talked about of the the profound recognition of interdependence of the Ticha Samupada in which we can really understand and feel as our practice deepens of how closely connected and interpenetrative all life forms are on this planet. And we're really trying to take it to the next step to, to experiment, to um, to try to develop forms to see what will it take in a state, uh, and let's just say maybe Northern California, since California is so large, in Northern California, and we actually do draw people from out of state, even from other countries, uh, who want to see what we're doing. But what would it take in an area of, of the United States that is so multicultural as the Bay Area? to create a truly inclusive and welcoming multicultural sangha, which is open to, rather than, than suppressing or repressing of difference. Uh, and what would, if we're composed of so many different elements and diverse peoples from very various uh, backgrounds, what would be actually the social glue or the cohesion or the spiritual cohesive force that would bring us together while honoring, not only honoring our diversity, but recognizing it and drawing upon it as a rich resource. I would say that's a pretty good um, description in a nutshell. I've also been um, active with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship for, oh, I don't know, my kid is 26 years old, so more than 25 years, I guess. And uh, I'm a socially engaged Buddhist, uh, uh, active with the Buddhist Peace Fellowship as well. So, um, our mission 
at statement at East Bay Meditation Center, and actually we, we tweaked it in the past few years with the um, very generous help of two attorneys from the San Francisco Buddhist Temple, uh, Camille Hamilton Hayding and most especially Amy uh, Budiahara, and uh, she helped us to, to just really bring it into focus one more notch. Our mission statement says, founded to provide a welcoming environment for people of color, members of the LGBTQI community, and so uh, we put that I in there to recognize uh, intersex individuals, and also an A is sometimes uh, put in there now uh, for asexual. So therefore, our um, sitting group that's LGBTQ, <coughs> I-A, S-G-L, same gender, loving, calls himself the alphabet saga. <laughs> Otherwise it would take too long. Uh, so founded to provide a welcoming environment for people of color, and that's already a political term you'll notice, members of the LGBTQI community, people with disabilities, and other underrepresented communities. The East Bay Meditation Center welcomes everyone seeking to end suffering and cultivate happiness. Our mission is to foster liberation, personal and interpersonal healing, social action, and inclusive community building. We offer mindfulness practices and teachings on wisdom and compassion from Buddhist and other spiritual traditions. Rooted in our commitment to diversity, we operate with transparent democratic governance, generosity-based economics, and that, uh, I'll go into that more later, it's in the handout, but what that means is we're part of the worldwide gift economics movement, and so we are a Donna-only center. In other words, unless it's a, a fundraiser, for any EBMC sitting group, class, workshop, half-day, full-day retreat, no one is ever charged any set fee to come through our doors. Uh, we invite people to give generously. We are sustained by gifts from the community, and this allows full access for people who are underemployed, unemployed, uh, low income, and a significant portion of our sangha are, um, are low income because that barrier isn't there. Some folks have even said, I know, uh, who are low income have said, you know, even if I go to a place that is so generous uh, and they offer a retreat or some kind of Buddhist activity or event and they have scholarships or work trades, that still means I have to go through an application process and separate myself from everyone else and that means that I am treated differently while everyone else is um, enjoying the full program, I might be having to do some kind of work trade. And because I'm a low-income person, I'm already exhausted. So it just exhausts me to even think of going through that process. So this is not to disparage uh, the existence of scholarships because they are wonderful and they're useful. It's just to bring in the voices of those who could benefit from that access and who are too exhausted to go through those processes or, or just want to have the full experience and relax along with everyone else. So we decided from the beginning we would not have those structures. We wanted to be fully accessible. Uh, and to try to develop the practice, and this has been very challenging, it's probably been our major challenge, is to educate on an ongoing basis what Donna means, what gift economics means. Uh, none of our teachers, including myself, are paid. When we teach, we never know what income is going to come from until it comes in. And uh, that's, that's something that can be very anxiety producing. At the same time, it's such a joyful feeling to know that, uh, that we're receiving these gifts from, from the community. So that's something that we're continually working with. Um, Generosity-based economics and environmental sustainability. 
so there we have our green initiative. We do try to be a very green uh, saga and to within our budget to just do all of the things that we can do to contribute to a smaller carbon footprint on, on the planet. And because so many of our members are social justice activists, uh, there are members of our Sangha who are very much involved in work on global climate change. So, um, we can recognize that California as a state, I would say many and most urban areas of the United States are increasingly diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, religious pluralism, and other dimensions of diversity. If some of you uh, are familiar with this, and some are not, I really recommend it. It's a book I can see recommended by Bill Moyers called A New Religious America. It's not that new right now. I think it's still quite good by Dr. Diana Eck of Harvard University. And it's subtitled, How a Christian Country, in quotes, has become the world's most religiously diverse nation. So we're all coming closer together in this um, immensely rich mix. And that, uh, when, when diverse people come together, uh, diversity tension occurs friction occurs between people from different cultures with different values, with different uh, goals, with different ways of doing things and understanding the world as well as we all have individual differences. And this is, this discomfort, the fear of confrontation, the fear of conflict is something that's very natural. I'm afraid of conflict myself. Uh, it scares me if conflict erupts in a group. And I also know that I need to find ways to overcome that. And collectively, we need to find ways to deal with that. And we can. There's a lot of great facilitation help and mediation help, restorative justice, uh, circle processes, lots of different processes that we all can use to help us get over that barrier of feeling, oh, oh what if people start to fight? Well, what if they disagree because they just come from such different backgrounds and they're passing like ships in the night or, uh, or just coming to some impasse where we feel that war is going to erupt in the saga. Oh no, oh no, let's keep everything the same. Let's, let's grasp onto our similarities and our sameness and we're going to cash in on that. That is actually very natural for how humans bond in an increasingly diverse, pluralistic, multicultural state, nation, world. Uh, it, it is something that we need to learn a new way of being and new skills uh, in order to open our temples and to become more inclusive. Um, for East Bay Meditation, we are actively involved with supporting the Black Lives Matter movement, marriage equality, and equal rights for LGBTQIQ, uh, the same gender loving community, and concerned with issues of gentrification in the Bay Area, in areas like the Mission District in San Francisco, and in downtown Oakland where our folks uh, and or their families live. And it was really wonderful to see the list of long list of, of incredibly rich projects that uh, the Buddhist Church of San Francisco was involved in. I was very inspired. So therefore, um, social engagement at this point in our temple's history isn't mostly about collecting food or money to help people in need in other countries. Uh, it's not about what's out there. It's what a, what's, it's concentrating on what's in here and the transformation of our minds and hearts individually and collectively so that we begin to understand how we react to difference and, and how it is that we can be together in a way that um, we hope that the fewest number of people feel, I won't say no one because that's an absolute, but we hope the fewest number of people feel that when they come in the doors of the temple, they don't, this is called, they don't have to check parts of themselves at the door. <coughs> so you know when you go into a theater or 
uh, some of some restaurants or some places, you check your excess stuff before you sit down at your table or your seat. You there's a coat check room, and you leave your coat and your hat, your scarf, um, maybe some things that you bought along the way, and you, you put all of that there so that when you sit down, we can kind of fit into your seat better. If we apply that metaphor, however, to the fullness of who we are in our many identities. Uh, so I'm a third generation Japanese American who grew up in Ohio. However, I entered into the Dharma through Korean Zen in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So that's why my name is Mushim, which is a Korean romanization instead of Mushim, which is the Japanese word coming from the Heart Sutra. I have a degree in English literature uh, and creative writing. I am a mother. Uh, I'm a person with a disability. I have multiple chemical sensitivities. So these are all parts of who I am. And if I have to cut off any of it, then I'm actually not relating to you in a way that's fully authentic or that, uh, that recognizes. And in return, if I'm not fully receiving who you are, in so much as you would be so generous to share with me, then our working together can't be as creative, it can't be as dynamic, it can't draw upon all of the resources that we all have that are so desperately needed to address how we are together and what we can achieve. Um, a typical example of that would be uh, folks who are in the LGBTQIQ community who go into situations where they feel they have to uh, remain in, in the closet. And as we know, that just takes so much energy to, to not reveal that um, uh, the name of our partner or something about ourselves, which is just actually part of our everyday life. And the same is going to be true for any other part of identity. So we're trying to create a situation where people don't need to check parts of themselves at the door, can enter fully, and can interact with one another fully. So this is very hard work that often feels counterintuitive. Why? Because the natural human tendency to, is to be attracted to perceptions of cultural sameness and to want to rest and relax and perceive sameness. It's a lot of work interacting in a multicultural situation. One has to keep so many things in mind. You know you're going to mess up sooner or later. And that can be scary. And there's just something so relaxing about sort of being in the zone of one's culture. I was just in Rome for a week with this fabulous Buddhist Catholic leaders uh, dialogue and fraternity conference where so many BCA reverends were present. And the, the food, of course, was, was fabulous. And I do eat a lot of Italian food in the Bay Area and get the great olive oil and so forth. But when I came home, and after this incredibly long plane trip, I phoned my son, uh, my adult son who lives with me, from the San Francisco airport prior to getting on BART. I said, put on some white rice. <laughs> and when I got home, I immediately broke out the top one. <laughs> I just like, it was like, I'm home. <laughs> and so that helped me to just relax uh, and know I was home. So that's very natural. Uh, yeah, uh, becoming an inclusive, welcoming, and safe sangha. So when we receive people in their fullness, that creates safety for them. Uh, involves really a whole new way of being and what we might call, uh, I would call a way of being for the 21st century. So we actually need a, a toolkit with a new way, a new ways of thinking, of acting, of being together. Um, a way of being that is increasingly comfortable with cultural discomfort. Increasingly comfortable with cultural discomfort. That is open to and curious about difference and that is aware of how dynamics of power and unearned privilege play out in the larger society as well as in our own sangha. 
So a good example of that, of how these dynamics might play out is uh, I have been to various kinds of gatherings where really good faith efforts were made, for instance, to uh, make sh try to ensure that there was some uh, representation of women in what had been usually were largely male-dominated groups. So there we have a situation, and there's the best of intentions, and the women are there, and the men are there, and then through some magical and unknown force, uh, that men end up really being the leaders of the meeting, doing most of the talking, and really making the decisions. So even though uh, the women are there, those dynamics of dominant power structures are still being played out uh, really unconsciously often. That's, that's how it goes. In many cases, unless we consciously take it in hand and work with it. As today, black churches in the South are burned and attacked, we readily see the grave social implications of unexamined <coughs> power and privilege in our wider society, such as white supremacy, racism, heterosexism, homophobia, transphobia, discrimination against people with disabilities, classism, and we could go on adding to this list. So thank you for accompanying me on this journey today. And I learned that word accompany from the dialogue in Rome, where the Catholics uh, talked about the, um, the idea and the principle of uh, accompagnare, where we um, were not present to teach each other things. I mean, we might teach each other things along the way, or uh, it's more like spiritual friends who say, I commit to being with you. I'm not here to fix you. I'm not here to solve your problems. Uh, I'll give you resources, of course, if I have them, and you give me resources. Uh, I'm not here to, uh, to change who you are. I'm here to, to go with you. And as we know, uh, if people are, don't feel isolated, uh, usually for most human beings, we just feel a lot better. For me, my brain works better. I mean, if someone sits with me and helps me go through something I'm kind of scared about on the computer to learn something new, they actually don't even have to say anything. They just have to sit there. And, so, and that as a human being, I just feel accompanied. I feel supported. I was a volunteer in the Oakland Public Schools for 11 out of 13 years when my kid went through the open public schools K through 12. I would go in uh, to all of those schools into the classes and uh, was a literacy tutor. And I would often find that with children having uh, issues with reading and writing, they knew what to do, they knew how to work, but they lacked that feeling that someone was accompanying them. And a lot of times I would just sit next to them and I wouldn't be looking at my phone and I wouldn't be doing anything else. I would just be sitting, just being with them, and they could read better uh, when they had that accompaniment. So on this journey of becoming inclusive and welcoming, uh, we can accompany one another and that, that is my hope. So I'd now like to turn, um, in the time that I have left, to the handout that I gave you. And I hope that this is something that you will feel free, if you'd like, to uh, email us about at East Bay Meditation Center, ask any questions. Um, we're just happy to spread any best practices we have. Not all of them will apply to CPA, because your situation is different from ours. But it might plant a seed that creates some innovative, creative idea um, for your circumstances and your sangha. And um, you can go to our website, eastbaymeditation.org, and if you can contact us, you get the admin email address, and I'm the person who almost 99% of the time is going to process that or you can ask for me. <coughs> so I've included three uh, sheets, which are all extremely important to, uh, we feel, in creating inclusive and welcoming with us. The first page points to the principles of cultural humility. And these principles are so woven into how we have been from, uh, from the very beginning.
beginning, um, before we opened our doors in our former location on Broadway at 22nd, it was just a little storefront. We were almost immediately overwhelmed and began looking for a larger uh, space. And so these principles of cultural community have been extremely important to us. How many of you, um, if I may ask, have heard about cultural community or are familiar with it? <coughs> And you can watch it for free, and I would really urge you to do so because the principles, when they're extracted, look kind of dry, and you know they're kind of desiccated or freeze dried. And they, you need to put that water in of the context of the examples, faces, and voices. And what I love about the YouTube video, which is a film um, by Vivian Chavez. Um, and that includes interviews with the founders uh, of Cultural Humility, uh, Dr. Melanie Turbelon, Dr. Jan Mori Garcia, and also many other folks appear uh, in, this, in this video, is that it starts out with close-ups of people's faces saying, the essence of cultural humility, what I think it is, is love. And that's repeated over and over. And so it's also about um, it's also about the feeling that we have. Uh, cultural humility is, I would say, love that is manifested in culturally sensitive and embodied ways. So I just made that up. You know, with you right now. Uh, I don't think it's original to me, but I don't, didn't have it written down. I, I do think it is love uh, that is manifested in culturally sensitive and embodied ways. Spiritual people can say with the best of intentions, I love you so much, and they genuinely mean it, and that is a beautiful thing. However, if it's said without being sensitive to who we are culturally, and how we show up in the world, how we want to be seen, heard, valued, recognize, and there's a big missing piece there. There's a big missing piece. So um, the principles are, first of all, that we commit ourselves through cultural humility to become lifelong learners. And from what I know, the spirit of Jodo Shinshu and uh, all of my long association with folks in the DCA, I would say, you folks really have, I mean, you are great examples and inspirations in, in this way. Just that kind of really humble attitude of, I don't know it all, uh, which is just common sense, actually. I mean, how could any one person know everything about every culture? Completely impossible. So we just take that humble position. Uh, I want to be a lifelong learner, and I also want to constantly engage. So this is a daily practice in critical, self-reflection. It's really turning that gaze inward and asking ourselves, well, okay, I mean, how, how am I doing about being comfortable with discomfort? How am I, um, how do I feel that I'm being able to receive people who are different than myself? You know, there's, I know in me there's sometimes this little, like, cringing feeling when I bump up against someone whose politics are very different from my own whose attitudes are really different from my own. There's that contractive feeling, and I just want to sort of defend them. And, and uh, it's a very physical feeling, actually. It's mindfulness. We can, we can really understand that. And instead, if there's no physical threat, to learn to feel, well, that's their point of view. Hmm. I wonder what it is in their life experience that has led them to feel and think and experience in this way. So I'm shifting into curiosity and self-reflection of that mindfulness check-in. Hmm, how's this feeling in my body and my mind in the way that I'm able to receive or not receive this person? We recognize and change power imbalances. So that's huge. And in many Buddhist institutions, uh, you know, it comes from Asia, there are hierarchical forms, there are, um, uh, not everything is an even playing field, it actually doesn't even need to be, so long as we are willing to recognize and change 
harmful power imbalances. The abbot uh, of Zen Center of Los Angeles, my friend uh, Wendy and Yohu Nakao Roshi, uh, went there to take over that very, very troubled and wounded sangha, was wounded through power of use from their founding teacher many years ago. And the first thing she said she did was she instituted a uh, way of council sharing the circles where everyone in the circle was equal and they all spoke to one another as equals. And she said that actually had no conflict with when she appeared as the abbess or abbot of the temple with all the robes and that she clearly wanted to be seen uh, in that role and given uh, the respect that was due to that position of authority. Then when she appeared in the council circle, she said she trained people so that when she said something, or when other people said something, they didn't immediately look at her like, mm, what's her reaction? They learned to look at one another. How, how, is, how is this being received? And to feel the equality of the circle form, uh, which is an indigenous form. Uh, so that's something that we can do is learn more about and see if we can embrace the principles of cultural humility. The second page are East Bay Meditation Center's agreements for multicultural interaction. I would say these are some of the most important um, practices that we do. We are a meditation-based, mostly mindfulness meditation, uh, the using the um, Theravada Vipassana, uh, mindfulness method. But we do have some Zen meditation. And so those are practices that are important to people. I would say equally, maybe even more important for our spiritual growth are these agreements, which are adapted from uh, those put out by Visions Incorporated. And they are a diversity consulting um, group on a very notable group on the East Coast that, that works nationally. So we have tweaked some of these. and. Um, and adapted them for our use, and they're very, very actively. I've done numerous trainings now, including of uh, a group of, of uh, teachers in training under Jack Cornfield through the Spirit Rock IMS um, group. So th these will be the next group of teachers, generation of teachers from through those organizations, as well as for our own teachers uh, on the, the use of these multicultural interaction agreements. I use them a lot in my own teaching. And you'll see that they contain within them the actual forms of cultural humility. So for instance, move up, move back. Usually, I think originally it said step up, step back. Folks in our community who use wheelchairs and their allies pointed out that that was not fully, in, that wording was not inclusive of people in wheelchairs and scooters who have mobility issues. So we use move up, move back. And that says encourage full particip participation by all present. That's co a co responsibility we all can share in a general discussion. Take note of who is speaking and who is not. Are those people who have been silent during this discussion? silent because they don't have anything to say, because they're just silent types, <coughs> they're tired. We don't know and we cannot make that assumption unless we invite everyone to speak. And when we do and create forms where people feel comfortable speaking uh, and feel safe speaking, then we might be able to hear and usually are able to hear voices that can surprise us that can provide fresh perspectives, that can provide insights we never even dreamed of. If you tend to speak often, consider moving back, and vice versa. If you're one of those people who's kind of shy and it scares you to hear your voice or to use a microphone, boldly try to move up, go into your zone of discomfort and empower yourself. We want to hear your voice. <coughs> So this is, um, these are agreements that are, uh, we feel, important practices. And then the last page are the five principles of gift economics at the Meditation Center. Uh, 
Uh, these are group formulated for our community. So you can find a lot on the economics on the internet. However, here, uh, this specifically applies to us. And this uh, is a wonderful infographic that was donated by a volunteer graphic designer who actually teaches graphic design. So we're, it's new, we're very pleased with it. And this uh, shows you some of the, the underpinnings of our gift economic system or all Dhamma system at East Bay Meditation Center. How we conceptualize it, how we're educating about it, and how we invite people to look into it. This is just much more than throwing a few dollars or maybe even writing a larger check uh, or volunteering to help sustain East Bay Meditation Center. It actually involves the understanding and the curiosity that as we learn more about what it takes to sustain our temple and our teachers, uh, and the more that we involve ourselves, uh, the more that we actually understand what is needed from a community in order for this community not only to survive, but to thrive, to blossom, and then for those rewards and those benefits and, and that richness to then come forward back to us as a donor. So it's that synergistic relationship between giving and receiving by which all are enriched. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Now I can